Hello, I'm Costas Canaris and I'm a consultant in pediatric intensive care and retrieval medicine. Today, I will be speaking to you about a difficult intubation. This is based on a real case. The initial format was intended to be interactive in nature, but we will have to do a question and answer version instead. So please grab a pen and paper and get ready to answer some questions. Hermione is a four-year-old girl that was brought in by ambulance to our emergency department. She's had chest pain for the last 24 hours. For the background of that, she's had a three-month history of shortness of breath and static weight. Her vital signs are sat of 94% when upright, and these drop to 84% when she lies flat. Her respiratory rate was 16. She had a heart rate of 180, a capillary refill time of three seconds, both central and peripheral. Her non-invasive blood pressure is 92 over 45, and her GCS was 10. She was afebrile at 37 degrees. On examination, her chest was dull to percuss bilaterally and she had subcostal recession. She had warm peripheries and would develop facial cyanosis and congestion whenever she lifted her, her arms up for a cuddle. A chest x-ray and a capillary gas were taken, both of which are shown on your screens. Please take a minute to interpret them both and write your answers on a piece of paper. You now have five minutes to answer these five questions. What clinical sign is Hermione exhibiting? What are your top five differentials? What worries you the most about the gas? What worries you the most about the observations? And what is your airway and breathing plan?
What clinical sign is Hermione exhibiting? Well done to those that said the Pemberton sign. This was named after Hugh Pemberton, who was a Liverpudlian physician born in the late 1800s. The Pemberton manoeuvre is a physical examination tool used to demonstrate the presence of latent pressure on the thoracic inlet. In this case, it is likely to be due to obstruction of the superior vena cava. The manoeuvre is achieved by having the patient elevate both arms, usually 180 degrees anterior flexion at the shoulder, much like trying to get a cuddle in a child, until the forearms touch the sides of the face. A positive Pemberton sign is marked by the presence of facial congestion and cyanosis, as well as respiratory distress after about one minute. The large mediastinal mass on the x-ray is pretty hard to miss. Be aware that for a child to be exhibiting respiratory symptoms with an x-ray appearance like that, there is likely to be more than 50% narrowing of any part of the airway. Symptoms associated with mediastinal masses, especially anterior in nature, include air hunger, dyspnea, wheezing, anxiety, and the child having a preferred position of comfort, usually upright or semi-upright. If the mass is anterior in nature and is large enough, then usually a child is unlikely to be able to lie flat. In superior vena cava obstruction, the symptoms include facial swelling, upper limb swelling, periorbital edema, conjunctival suffusion, dizziness, and headache. You need to have a high index of suspicion in inexperienced clinicians that may label this combination of symptoms as anaphylaxis, and you need to be ready to question it. Question two, what are your top five differentials? You need to be aware that up to 55% of all mediastinal masses in children are anterior in nature. Differentials for anterior mediastinal masses include Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, germ cell tumors, thymic tumors, and thyroid tumors. If it's a middle mediastinal mass, then the differentials are slightly different. These include parathyroid adenomas, tracheal tumors, pericardial cysts, and esophageal tumors. If they are posterior, these tend to be neurogenic or neuroendocrine in origin. Questions three and four. What worries you the most about the observations and the gas? This is perhaps the most subjective question. The combination of hypercarbia and altered sensorium should always ring alarm bells. This child has a respiratory acidosis that is no longer able to compensate by blowing off its own CO2. This, coupled with orthopnea, should put the differential of anterior metastinal mass very high up on your list. The inability to compensate one's own CO2 is a concern as it suggests that the patient is tiring with a very high possibility of a respiratory collapse or arrest unless we do something about it imminently. I will spend the rest of the talk trying to answer the final question, which is what is your airway and breathing plan? It is vital to understand that in cases of big an anterior mediastinal masses, intubation should be postponed unless absolutely necessary. We need to consider using non-invasive ventilation to improve oxygenation and improve blowing off CO2. And if possible, we need to see if there's another way in which to alleviate that pressure effect that the mass has both on the airway and the superior vena cava. With the help of our oncology and hematology team, we may be able to use steroids or chemotherapy or radiotherapy to shrink the mass enough in order to have further tests and imaging done. It's important for big masses to think about the possibility of tumor lysis syndrome. Tumor lysis prevention regimes include hyperhydration, usually 2.5 to 3 liters per meter square of fluid, using allopurinol and or rasburicase to try and minimize the risk of tumor lysis. Remember that in most cases, the masses are distal to the point where the endotracheal tube will be inserted if it comes to that. This is clinically significant as we are not going to be able to splint the airway using a tube as the obstruction is distal to the tube. It is therefore vital to explore the possibility 
of having some imaging, ideally a CT. As the child is unable to lie flat, we need to see whether our friendly radiologist is able to do a sitting up or semi-upright CT. There may of course come a point where you will have to intubate children with anterior mediastinal masses. This is not a decision to be taken lightly, nor is it a skill for the faint-hearted. So you need to be absolutely clear about the indications for intubation for such patients. Hypoxia is perhaps the commonest indication. So if the child is receiving 100% supplemental oxygen and is still hypoxic, then you are likely to need to intubate. If the child has a GCS of eight or less and, and is getting worse, then the patient is unlikely to be able to maintain their own airway for much longer. So you're li again likely to need to intubate that child. If the patient is becoming fatigued, as shown by the inability to compensate their CO2, which is rising and uh, with worsening respiratory acidosis, then again, you're likely to need to intubate. The final indication for um, needing to intubate such patients is significant cardiovascular compromise. Recommended anesthetic techniques for children with anterior mediastinal masses include inhalation induction with maintenance of spontaneous respiration, usually using an awake fiber optic technique. The use of continuous positive airway pressure may help to maintain functional residual capacity that is otherwise reduced under anesthesia. Remember, it's ideal to have venous access in the lower extremities as the superior vena cava is likely to be obstructed, impairing therefore drug and fluid delivery to the right place. By keeping the head of the bed elevated, you may decrease the deleterious effects of supine positioning, including the upward displacement of the diaphragm and the secondary reduction of thoracic volume, which will make your ventilation much more difficult. Keeping the patient in partial or even full right lateral decubitus position, you may be able to help them to maintain airway patency and reduce cardiac and vascular compression, i.e. you divert pressure away from the heart. Performing tracheal intubation under deep inhalational anesthesia without the use of muscle relaxants and positive pressure ventilation may result in a more normal transpulmonary pressure gradient and improved flow through the contacting airways. The decrease in chest wall tone associated with paralysis is thought to increase the risk of severe airways compression. You should almost never use paralysis in patients with large anterior mediastinal masses. As an alternative to tracheal intubation, the use of laryngeal mask airways have also been described. The use of a helium oxygen mixture has also been advocated to allow laminar flow and decrease resistance to gas flow in the conducting airways. In the event of tracheal or bronchial collapse under anesthesia, a rigid bronchoscope may prove to be life-saving. It's also worth trying, trying to prone the patient after intubation if this happens, as you will be using gravity to divert pressure away from the affected airways. It is also worth remembering that intubating a patient in an ECMO center whilst having ECMO on standby is the gold standard of intubation of the, in these patients. In the UK, we have mobile ECMO capabilities for children, so if you're if your patient is heading towards the direction of intubation, it may be well worth exploring by discussing it initially by your critical care retrieval team regionally. There is some evidence to suggest that croup tubes or armor tubes are superior and a safer option for use uh, as endotracheal tubes for intubating patients with anterior mediastinal masses. Many of you may appreciate an al algorithm to put all your thoughts in a, in a row as to how to manage a child that presents to your ED department with an anterior mediastinal mass. This flowchart is taken from the seminal paper quoted above and it is open access in nature and I would highly recommend that you have a read. It will also give you access to this flowchart. It's worth remembering that predictors for safe general anesthetic in such patients 
include an echo to evaluate cardiac mortality and venous return, pulmonary function tests, and peak expiratory flow rates or more than 50% predicted, and also a CT-directed tracheal cross-sectional area of more than 50%. So essentially, anything that suggests that the airway is obstructed by more than 50% makes these a high anesthetic risk case. Above all, remember that the acute management of a child with a mediastinal mass that presents to your ED department is a team sport. You're likely to need the pediatric team, the hematology oncology team, your anesthetic team, as well as pediatric critical care. If you're in a hospital without PICU support, you will almost definitely need advice from your PICU transport team, who may also put you in touch with a regional ECMO center. You might also need the help of your ENT surgeons. Always remember to make time for the family. Have someone allocated from within your team to update them every 20 minutes to half an hour and to check in on them to make sure they're okay. This may well be a bad day at the office for you, but this is almost certainly the worst day in that family's life. Thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions.